clearly going to look at identifying and preventing vulnerabilities. And this builds on the last lesson where we were looking at the threats to commute systems and networks. Quick starter activity. So you've got three words that have uh, been encrypted using a Caesar cipher shift. Now, Caesar cipher shift is essentially where letters are moved up or down the alphabet to shift their position. So you've got the alphabet on the screen, and you can see in the first example where FDFKH has been shifted three letters along. So in order to reverse this encryption, move it three letters back and try and decrypt the words. Okay, so specification content. There are a few sort of methods that we're going to look at, and we'll try to identify where these will support and help um, rectify any threats that are posed to our computer systems or networks. So we're going to look at penetration testing, anti-malware software, firewalls, user access levels, passwords, encryption, and physical security. I'll leave this just so you can read it for a second. So <clears throat> penetration testing. Now, penetration testing is the idea of ethical hacking as such. And this is where you might employ someone from your company or employ an external company to try and hack into your network or try and break down through the security that you have in place on your computer system or network, just to kind of highlight any vulnerabilities that exist. So the idea being that in doing this, you're aware of them and can fix them before it is so that someone can cause harm or damage to your network um, by them finding them first. And this helps with a number of different sort of threats uh, posed. But SQL injection is a, is a prime example. If you remember, SQL injection, as we said, is running scripts or commands to edit or amend a database. Um, and if we're aware of those sort of threats posed by that, because we've performed this penetration testing, it might be that we can fix those mistakes or fix those security flaws uh, before it is a case that someone's able to actually uh, run any of these sorts of threats. Anti-malware software then. So anti-malware software, if you remember about malware being vir viruses, worms, trojans, um, there are other things that fall under the category of anti-malware, such as spyware. And anti-malware software will kind of help to resolve all of these. And it does three sort of main things. So it detects this type of malware, it removes the malware, and it prevents you from getting the malware in the first place. So there's three purposes of anti-malware software. It isn't simply just a case of removing a virus. It's also detecting and preventing should it be a case, obviously, that you were to um, get any of these sort of threats onto your computer. So it, it, its main sort of focus, as I said, viruses, worms, trojans, under that sort of umbrella of malware. Firewalls. Firewalls are simply um, to put a sort of barrier between yourself and the outside world. So what we mean by that is when you connect your network to another network, say, for example, the internet, the firewall itself will manage the communication between those two networks. So it'll have, in essence, a list of allowed communications, and those will be allowed to pass through between the two. And then it will filter and block any sort of unauthorized access from your network. And this helps with a couple of things. So phishing is a prime example. If it's a case that you've got people trying to access your network or trying to get into your network using uh, deceptive emails and so forth, this may well support filtering that out. You've also got then denial of service attacks. So if it's a case, for example, that someone were to bombard your network with lots of unwanted data, your firewall uh, would hopefully do a good job of filtering it out so that it doesn't actually affect your systems themselves. These can be either hardware or software-based. Generally speaking, um, they're software-based, but hardware ones do exist as well. User access levels. So this is the idea that different users within a system will have uh, the ability to access and do certain things differently. So you'll have different levels of restrictions. And the clearest example of this will be when you think about your school computers. With the school computers, as a student, you would have the lowest level of access. So you might have access to the internet, but maybe perhaps it's filtered from things like social media and so forth. Um, maybe you've got limited restrictions in terms of the applications that you can run. Whereas teachers would have a higher level of access, it may be that they're able to run a wider range of applications and have a more unfiltered access to the internet. Whereas then the network manager would most likely have the highest level of access and probably have no little to no restrictions in place. And these user access levels exist to prevent harm being caused by people that don't necessarily need to have access to certain areas. And this again um, helps with a number of things, SQL injection being another, because it means that you're in a situation where the sort of lower level of users aren't able to access or maintain a database editing any records. But there are a few other scenarios where um, this will support protecting of files as well. Passwords. 
Now we all use passwords, but it's worth commenting that it's strong passwords in particular that we're looking at this. And this is those alphanumeric passwords where we've got letters, numbers, uppercase, lowercase, special characters, and the complexity of the password makes it slightly more difficult for someone to sort of gain access into your accounts or your systems. And this will help with brute force attacks because it's for the cases your password is more complex. It's gonna take far, far longer for someone to break into. Uh, equally, it might be that you put a limitation on the number of attempts that you can have at someone typing your password, which will support that brute force attack. Social engineering in itself as well. So if it's a case, for example, your password is complex and secure, that someone using um, social engineering methods may well find personal details about you, may well be able to get some information out of you, but it may well still not be sufficient to get into your accounts and systems by using or guessing your passwords. Encryption, we saw at the start of this presentation, a brief sort of touch on encryption. And if you remember, encryption is the idea of scrambling and disguising data so that it can't be understood should it be that someone uh, receives that data. So the idea is that when you're transmitting data around your network or whether you're storing it on your machine, it's encrypted in what's known as ciphertext. Now ciphertext is the jumbled up disguised message, plain text being the exact message we want to send. And the method of encryption, as we mentioned previously, is that our communication is encrypted using a key from the sender's end. The sender sends the key um, and the message across to the receiver. The person receiving that message then uh, receives the ciphertext, so they receive it in an encrypted format, use their key to unlock that message, to decrypt it, and then they're able to read it. And this supports with data interception. Uh, this helps to prevent the fact that someone may be able to use packet sniffing tools to find your data on a network, but if they were to find your data, it's not gonna have any meaning to them. As we said, it's already disguised. And then physical security. So physical security is one of those things that is often overlooked. We quite often think that using software or clever techniques to prevent any security threats is kind of the first and foremost thing, but physical security should never be underestimated. And this is simply just a case of keeping physical devices secure. And that might well be things like having your servers where all of your data is stored, locked behind a door. Because obviously, whilst we can sit there and stop someone from prevent, uh, accessing our network and prevent them from taking our data or editing our data in that method, fundamentally, we need to be sure that someone's not gonna be able to just walk in, pick up the storage devices that are attached to our servers and take the data physically. So it is a case that obviously we need to be mindful of the fact that physical security plays just as an important role as our digital methods. And this is again, is gonna help with the idea of data inception. Someone's not gonna be able to just walk in and take that data.